hello there and welcome to Tom and Tron Edge Control, where today we're going to be solving some mysteries for you guys. Are you actually How recording? does that sound? Yes, we are recording that right now, Tron. This is the intro and that's what we're going with. Okay. Is that all right with you, Cam? Yes, sir. I'm yes, sir. ready to uh, yeah, look at boy. Some mysteries right now. So, cool. The, the are you going to kick us off? We're going to go into... Actually, no, I'm not going to kick us off this week. Shall I kick us off this week? You actually recording, bro? Yeah, I am. Oh, okay. I'm kind of worried. The first thing I want to talk about this week <laughs> is the Kelly Hopkinsville encounter. The Kelly Hopkinsville encounter, also known as the Hopkinsville Goblins case, or the Kelly Green Men case, was a claimed close encounter with extraterrestrial beings in 1955 near the communities of Kelly and Hopkinsville in Christian County, Kentucky, United States. UFOologists regard it as one of the most significant and well-documented cases in the history of UFO incidents, while skeptics say the reports were due to the effects of excitement and misidentification of natural phenomena such as meteors and owls. The United States Air Force classified the alleged incident as a hoax in the Project Blue Book files. Psychologists have used the alleged incident as an academic example of pseudoscience to help students distinguish truth from fiction. Is the general overview of this case. Yes, that is the general overview of the case. Um, and we're now going to dive deep into this case and solve dive deeper than your mum into your dad's batty crack. <laughs> We're going snuffling for truffles. Oh dear, okay. Oh, producer Kate is happy that um, her pajamas are above hot tub and bobcat. I mean, that's good. That's good. They are Croatian pajamas, though. Have you got something against Croatians, John? I do. I do have something against Croatians. That pesky Luka Modric. That's group. I'd say good. I was now just going to continue reading the rest of this. Okay. <laughs> well, this has started off as a shout. <laughs> yes, for those of you who don't know, we're currently recording straight after the back of the previous episode, and so I we can try and get and this uh, banker uh, done. Uh, and, and keep running you with this content. We can the half serious, half seriously questioning, are you actually recording right now? Twice. Should we restart? Are you hungry? Uh, no, I, I, I've been scranning during the, uh, the episode. Oh, so. I'm getting hungry. Oh, well, I'll eat. Oh, we'll carry on. We cut, to, we cut to the chase. We cut to the chase. On the evening of August 21st, 1955, five adults and seven children arrived at the Hopkinsville police station claiming that small alien creatures from a spaceship were attacking their farmhouse. <laughs> they had been holding them off with gunfire for nearly four hours. <laughs> Two of the adults, Elmer Sutton and Billy Ray Taylor, claimed they had been shooting at a few short, dark figures who repeatedly popped up at the doorway or peered into the windows. The Kentucky New Era, the first paper to report the incident, amplified the number to 12 to 15, and that number continues to be reported. Concerned about gun battle between local citizens, four city police officers, five state troopers, three deputy sheriffs and four military police officers from the nearby United States Army Fort Campbell drove to the Sutton farmhouse located near the town of Kelly in Christian County. Their search yielded nothing apart from evidence of gunfire and holes in windows and door screens made by firearms. Residents of the farmhouse included Glennie Lankford, her children Lonnie, Charlton and Mary, Two sons from a previous mass marriage, Elmer Lucky Sutton, John Charlie J.C. Sutton, their respective wives, Vera and Aline, Aline's brothers, O.P. Baker and Billy Ray Taylor and his wife, June. How many fucking people in the house? There's a lot of people in the house. They're probably just <laughs> shooting at their kids. <laughs> my sons are. They're just pissed up shooting at kids they didn't recognise. <laughs> Both the Taylors, Lucky and Vera Sutton, were reportedly itinerant carnival workers who were visiting the farmhouse. The next day, neighbours told two officers that the families had packed up and left after claiming the creatures had returned about 3.30 in the morning. Ooh! 3.30 in the morning. It's a very creepy time to return. It is. It is. Um, yeah. What do we think so far, Tron? Um, so, obviously, they're in a farmhouse shooting at some things that they think are aliens. But they could just be shooting at their own kids because one of one of them, as you were saying, uh, they are like kids from a previous marriage. So maybe they're just using it to try and shoot their kids from previous <laughs> marriage. I hope maybe. not. Maybe. I hope not. But yeah, I I would love to believe in what I'm listening to. So far, it does sound like it, it could be something could be happening. Could be. You know what it, it could, could be? be some aliens or 
E E E C's coming home. Or it could what? be little James Longquist levitating. With his no, feet. I, I don't think it's a little James Longquist in this one. Oh, he's I, not green, is he? No, he, he is the not green. Green children of Woolpit could have really. Yeah, the green children of Woolpit could be right. responsible for this. Not yeah. them again. So the press coverage received widespread. Was widespread. Uh, it was early widespread. articles did not refer to little green men. The colour was later added to some newspaper stories. Estimates of the size of the alleged creatures varied from two to four feet, and details such as large pointed ears, claw-like hands, and eyes that glowed, and yellow spindly legs later appeared in various media. I don't think you can get that from just eating beans. No, I, I don't. It doesn't sound like the green children are warped at the stand. No. Um, but yeah, psychologist Rodney Schmaltz and Scott Lillianfield cite the alleged incident as an example of pseudoscience and an extraordinary claim to help develop students' critical thinking skills. Although contemporary newspaper sto- stories allege that all officials appear to agree that there was no drinking involved, Schmaltz and Lillianfield suggested that intoxication may have played a part in the sighting. Well, you don't have to drink to be intoxicated. No, you don't. You c- they could be on some devil's lesson some shrooms some shrooms shrooms would make you see aliens with pointy ears yes the committee for sceptical inquiry member and sceptic Joe Nickel notes that the family could have misidentified eagle owls or great horned owls which are nocturnal fly silently have yellow eyes and aggressively defend their nests according to Nickel meteor sightings also occurred at the time that could explain Billy Ray Taylor's claim that he saw a bright light strike a bright light, a bright light, a bright light streak across the sky and disappear beyond a tree line some distance from the house. Interesting. Very interesting. Uh, is there anything else interesting? Uh, the UFOologist Jerome Clark writes that the supposed creatures floated through the trees, and the sound of bullets striking them resembled bullets striking a metal bucket. Clark describes an ob- odd luminous patch along a fence where one of the beings had been shot and in the woods beyond a green light whose source could not be determined. However, this description was consistent with Foxfire, a bioluminescent fungus on decaying wood. Um, yeah, so I think it was just some pissed up rednecks talking about goblins. Yep. Shooting at owls and kids. Sounds about right, doesn't it? Pissed yeah. up, pissed up rednecks fair. about goblins. Yeah. Did you want to go for the next one? I've got three more. How many have you got? I have um, a couple of weird ones. I've got a couple of weird ones as well. So we're, we're going to go with, with the less weird one first. So uh, do you remember that, that phase in YouTube a couple of weird, a couple of years ago where they had the doing stuff at 3am challenge? <laughs> oh, got like, the wrong <laughs> in the hood. Yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> the don't call Elmo at 3am challenge. You or came whenever, to my house. Whenever a celebrity would die, there'd be YouTubers yeah. going, yes. do not call this person at 3am. Like, the, the, they'll sign up before we get into the, yeah, this actual story. I watched one guy. I'm going to give him a big shout out called Omar Gosh TV. <laughs> <laughs> do not watch him. The guy, the guy does ghost hunting videos. He claims that he's like doing it all for real. But he goes to where Tupac was shot and claims he was he was listening to him in like a spirit box. And it's just this black man on the radio just speaking back to him. But anyway, it's great. Um, so we're going to get into this road in, in New Jersey called Clinton Road. And it runs for 10 miles. And uh, back to the YouTubers for a sec. Lots of them did. They would go up and down this road claiming to see some weird stuff. But um, I just want you to... Uh, to listen to some of the ghost stories on the road, uh, some of them are very stupid, but uh, the road's history, uh, the road and the land around it have gained notoriety over the years as an area rife with many legends of paranormal occurrences such as sightings of ghosts, strange creatures and gatherings of witches, satanists and the Ku Klux Klan. So a lot of stuff is happening on this said road in New Jersey. It's also rumoured that professional killers dispose of bodies in the surrounding woods with one recorded case of this occurring. It has been a regular subject of discussion in Weird NJ magazine, which once devoted an entire issue to it. In the words of a local police chief, it's a long, desolate stretch and makes the imagination go nuts. So, obviously, with the history of the road, it only made sense all of these weird YouTubers would go and drive up and down it and make weird videos about it. Yeah. And uh, some of the legends of this road is uh, one of them's the Ghost Boy Bridge. The Ghost Boy The Bridge. Ghost Boy Bridge. According to Weird NJ, a great magazine, of course, there is a legend that if someone puts a quarter in the middle of the road where the yellow line is at the one of the bridges over Clinton Brook, 
near the reservoir at midnight, it will supposedly be promptly returned by the ghost of a boy who drowned while swimming below or had fallen in while sitting at the top of the edge of the bridge. Weird Wikipedia. Okay. In some tellings, an apparition is seen. In others, a ghost pushes a teller into the water if they look on the other side of the bridge in order to save them from being run over as he was in real life. What do we think of the Ghost Boy Bridge then? Um, it sounds weird. It does sound weird. Apparently, if you just put a quarter on the road, a ghost boy will come and say hi. So, pretty much. But So, there's just a kid coming for money. It's just a kid coming for money. Pretty much. Um, there's been lots of ghost boy incident incidences but that isn't those aren't the uh the funny ones we want to get into yeah the funny one we want to get into is there are ghost trucks okay so according to travel channel show most terrified places in america too phantom vehicles such as pickup trucks or even floating headlights not attached to any vehicle supposedly appear from nowhere in the middle of the night and chase drivers to the end of the road then disappear and uh, I watched this YouTube video of this guy trying to follow the trucks and it just turned out it was this random guy just driving a truck nice. which would make sense uh, and the other one is there's somehow a hellhound there who's also called Wolfie an albino wolf dog uh, and some monkeys and unidentifiable <laughs> hybrids are alleged by Weird NJ to have been seen at night if not of supernatural origin, there have been survivors of jungle habitat and nearby attraction has been closed in 1976, which have managed to survive and crossbreed. So basically, what is going on in this weird road in New Jersey is that it is a road to nowhere. There are these ghost trucks, which is just people going about their daily life driving trucks. There's this, there's this kid who picks up, <laughs> supposedly died, but you could get, you could summon him if you put a quarter on the road <laughs> and there's sure it's not just rednecks tripping creatures. balls again <laughs> exactly so what do you think about this rednecks tripping balls I think this is rednecks tripping balls it's just people from New Jersey just uh, driving down the road New Jersey redneck I mean where, where this is I think it is where is New Jersey it's close to New York oh yeah they look like they could be pretty redneck but uh, basically it's just it's a 10 mile road with nothing on it with just trees either side you're gonna see some weird shit yeah but anyway that adds the boring one but uh yeah the, the next one I've got is quite good cool. the next one I've got is called The Rat's Man of South End <laughs> <laughs> it's a bit of a grim one actually okay well, the rat these man are the good ones now The Rat Man of South End is an English urban legend originating in South End on Sea in Essex oh, the what story a of the, ma- the Rat Man tells of an old homeless man seeking shelter from the cold in an underpass was set upon by a group of youths and beaten to near death, cold and blood lost during the rest. As he died, the numerous vermin who, inha- who inhabit the area gathered and were found to have devoured his face. After this, a ghostly figure was spotted in the underpass, people hearing rap like squealing and scraping as if large claws were moving across the walls. Apparently there was a short film about the Rat Man of South End, <laughs> um, which was entered into a film festival there. Um, yeah, that's all it is. The rat there was a homeless happened. dude who got munched on by some rats. He got man turned into a rat man. Yeah. So but if we just look at the average inhabitant of South End, <laughs> most of them look a bit ratty anyway. <laughs> South End on sea. Just some normal person. From South End. Inhabitant. Turning so images. Tell me, this person doesn't look like they could be a rat man. I'm going to come and have a look at the rat man. Okay. Where's the rat man? That's a rat that man. That is a rat That's man. That's a rat man. <laughs> that is a rat. Oh, no. Definite rat man, for yeah. sure. There are some rat, rat men in South End. There are some rat men in South End. Oh, well, um, that was a short one. Do you want me to... How many more have you got? I've got one long one. One long one. So I'll get another... Is this one short? That one's reasonably short. Ah, this one's short. So, um, yeah. Cool. I've got the monkey man of Delhi. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> you have the Monkey Man. The of Monkey Delhi. Man of New Where Delhi, or well, the translation is the Face Scratcher, <laughs> Jesus. aka Carla Bondar, is an unknown anomaly which was reported to be roaming Delhi in mid two thousand and one. The entire incident has been described as an example of mass hysteria in India. 
In May 2001, reports began to circulate in the Indian capital New Delhi around a strange monkey-like creature that was appearing at night and attacking people. Eyewitness accounts were often inconsistent, but tended to describe the creature as about four feet tall, covered in thick black hair with a metal helmet, metal claws, <laughs> glowing red eyes and three buttons on its chest. Some reports also claim that the monkey man wore roller skates. <laughs> Others, however, <laughs> described the monkey man as having more of a vulpine snout and being up to eight feet tall and muscular. It would leap from building to building. <laughs> Over 350 sightings of the Kala Bandar were reported, as well as around 60 resulting injuries. Two, by some reports, even three people died when they leapt from the tops of buildings or fell down stairwells in panic caused <laughs> oh by what my. they thought was the attacker. Oh my At one God. point, exasperated police even issued artists' impression drawings in an attempt to catch the pip, catch the creature. Well... Do you want to come and see the artist impression they he, did? He went round in rollerblades, apparently. That's the artist impression they put out. <laughs> <laughs> that does not look very menacing. That no, it looks like a weird gift shop toy you get from somewhere in town. <laughs> yeah, if it was eight foot tall, I could see how it might be a bit menacing, but... Was it, didn't it say it was four foot, though? Yeah, but some reports said eight. <laughs> rollerblades. <laughs> 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 this monkey it's man. just a rollerblading dwarf with a gimp mask on. That's all it is. <laughs> it's a like gimp. He's gone to New Delhi. You know, when he was a kid? Yeah, just terrifying people. Oh. <laughs> a Somerset gimp. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so, no. Do you want to hit me with your one then? Okay, so this one's kind of serious. Kind of not. But, uh. So. This one is the trial of Arnie Cheyenne Johnson. So, uh, it's not just a normal a normal trial, though. The trial of Arnie Cheyenne Johnson, also known as the Devil Made Me Do It case, is the first known court case in the United States in which the defense sought to provide innocence based upon the claim of demonic possession and denial of personal responsibility for the crime. Ooh. On November 24th, 1981, in Brookfield, Connecticut, which is in uh, buttfuck nowhere, Arnie Shane Johnson was convicted of first-degree manslaughter for the killing of his landlord, Alan Bono. So, basically, the background of it is that uh, Arnie Shane Johnson, uh, Johnson, Johnson and Debbie Glatzel provided first-hand accounts for the version of events depicted Discovery Channel was a haunting episode where demons dwell. I don't know, I'm just giving them free advertising, but you know. Uh, they said their father was an eyewitness to demonic possession. Both Johnson and Debbie were adamant in their support of the Warrens' recollection of events. And of course, the Warrens are there, they're always there. They asserted that paranormal activity began after they went to clean up a rental property they had just acquired. David recollected an old man suddenly appeared, pushing and terrifying him. The couple initially thought David was using the old man's excuse to avoid cleaning, but David informed them the old man had vowed to harm the Glatzels if they moved into the rental home. David's visions of the old man included the man appearing as a demonic beast who muttered Latin and threatened to steal his soul. Although the family allegedly heard strange noises coming from the attic, no one but David ever witnessed the old man. After David experienced night terrors, exhibited strange behaviour, and obtained unexplained scratches and bruises, the family called upon the services of a Catholic priest who attempted to bless the house. The terrified family concluded that the house was evil and would no longer continue to rent it. After Debbie challenged it in curiousness about her and the rest of the family to be or not in the rental house, the demon made its presence known. Okay. David's visions worsened, occurring in the daytime as well. Twelve days after the original incident, the family summoned the self-proclaimed demonologist, Edmund Lorraine Warren, always there. Lorraine al allegedly witnessed a black mist materialize next to David, an apparent indication of a male malevolent presence. Debbie and her mother told the Warrens they had seen David being beaten and choked by invis invisible hands. How do you Ooh. see someone get beaten and choked by invisible hands, though? Because the hands are invisible. But anyways. Well, I suppose you could be going purple, couldn't you? Yep, and that red marks had appeared on his neck afterwards. David had started to growl, hiss, speak in otherworldly voices, and recite passages from the Bible or Paradise Lost. 
The Glezels recounted how each night a family member remained awake with David as he suffered through spasms and convulsions after receiving a prognosis of multiple possessions from the Warrens. David was subjected to three lesser exorcisms. Lorraine asserts that David levitated. Here we go. Levitating. Ceased breathing for a time and even demonstrated a supernatural ability of precognition. How long did he stop breathing for? I don't know. Because if he just said 30 seconds. Yeah, he just, he's just holding his breath, does it? <laughs> Uh, you demonstrate the supernatural ability precognition specifically in relation to the manslaughter Johnson would later commit in October 1980 the Warrens contacted Brookfield police to warn them that the situation was becoming dangerous okay now this is where it gets interesting according to eyewitness testimony uh, eyewitness testimonies Jesus Christ I can't speak Arnie Johnson oh by the way David's a little boy the one who's being possessed um, Arnie Johnson the main character of the story, coerced one of the demons who was in David to possess him while participating in David's exorcisms. So he wanted to get the demon away from the little boy. So he decided it would be great if it possessed him instead. instead. Yeah. Yeah. Which, it made sense, I guess. Um, According to the show, oh, we're not going to enter the show, but a few days after Johnson egged the demon on during the exorcism, he was attacked rather viciously by the demon which allegedly took control of his car and forced it into a tree. But Johnson was unharmed. Are you sure he wasn't just drink driving? <sighs> Maybe. After this incident, Johnson returned to rental property to examine an old well that supposedly housed a demon. Uh, this was his final encounter with the demon. And basically, he encountered the demon at the well, making eye contact with it, and he became possessed. So now he was possessed... Uh, David's condition worsened further Debbie and Johnson who had been living in her mother's home decided it was time to move Debbie was hired by Adam Bono a new resident in Brookfield as a dog groomer Debbie and Johnson began renting apartment close to her place of employment after moving in Johnson started to exhibit odd behaviour that was strikingly similar to David's after he'd been told the demon to possess him causing Debbie to fear he began become possessed as well. According to Debbie, Johnson would fall into a trance-like state wherein he would ground, hallucinate, but have no, na- no later memory of it. Okay, so this is when it gets interesting now. On February 16th, 1981, Johnson called in sick to his job at Wright Tree Service and joined Debbie at the kennel where she worked. Along with his sister, Wanda, what a great name, and Debbie's nine-year-old cousin, Mary, Bono, the couple's landlord, and Debbie's employer at the kennel, bought the group lunch at a local bar and proceeded to drink heavily. After lunch, the group returned to the kennel. Debbie then took the girls to get pizza, but insisted they return quickly, anticipating trouble. When they returned, Bono, intoxicated at this point, became agitated. Everyone left the room at Debbie's urging, except Bono, who seized Mary and refused to let go. Johnson heading back to the apartment and ordered Bono to release Mary. Uh, Mary ran to the car as Debbie attempted to mitigate the situation by standing between the two men. Wanda tried in vain to pull Johnson away. Johnson, growling like an animal, then drew a five-inch pocket knife and stabbed Bono repeatedly. Uh-oh. Bono died several hours later. According to Johnson's lawyer, Bono had suffered four or five tremendous wounds, uh, mostly to his chest and one that stretched from his stomach to the base of his heart. Johnson was discovered two miles from the site of the killing and was held at Bridgeport Correctional Center on bail. This was the first unlawful killing in the history of Brookfield, Connecticut. So basically, at the end of it, he then said that uh, in court that he was possessed by a demon and that he was not responsible for killing the person and he was the first ever person in uh, the US to say that he was innocent for his crime because he was possessed but obviously he was found guilty nah, so and it was, didn't set, work. It was sentenced to 10 to 20 years in pre- prison but only served 5 for good behaviour fair enough so yeah what do you think about that it's a very long-winded story. It is. Would you uh, opinions, Mister Tom? Um, I think it might come down to people tripping balls again. I think it, the fact that they were all severely intoxicated when it all happened. Yeah. And uh, it's in the middle of uh, the USA, where, as we know from our dumb American tourists, anything can go down in that place. It can. So it could have just been dumb American tourists, you know, just being stupid. Yeah. Do you have any more for me? I've got the melon heads. <laughs> okay, we're going from one serious one to the melon heads. Let's go. The melon heads. 
In American folklore of Ohio, Michigan, and Connecticut, melon heads are beings generally described as small humanoids with bulbous heads who occasionally emerge from hiding places to attack people. Different variations of the legend attribute different origins to the entities. Ooh. The melon heads. The, le- the melon heads of Michigan are said to reside a- around Felt Mansion. Felt Mansion. Felt Mansion. That's Although a they have emoji. also been reportedly seen in the southern forested areas of Ottawa County. According to one story, they were originally children with hydrocephalus. Is a condition. Hydrocephalus. Hydrocephalus. Syphilis. Um, it's an accumulation of cerebrospinal fluid within the brain. Ah. Um, uh, so it causes brain. increased pressure inside the skull, headaches, double vision, poor balance, urinary incontinence, personality changes, and stuff like that. Oh no! So stuff in their brain. Stuff in their brain. Who lived at the Junction Insane Asylum near Felt Mansion. The story explains that after enduring physical and emotional abuse, they became feral and were released into the forest surrounding the asylum. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Allegan County Historical Society asserts this the asylum never existed, although it was at one point a prison. However, the story has become part of the local folklore for several decades. Lake Town Township manager Al Meshkin told the Holland Sentinel that he had heard tales as a teenager, noting that his friends referred to the beings as wobbleheads. <laughs> wobbleheads. Wobble wobble. Wobble wobble wobble. Some versions of the some versions of the legend say that the children once lived in the mansion itself, but later retreated to a system of caverns or caves in a nearby hill, left over from an abandoned zoo. Some versions of the legend say the children devised a plan to escape and kill the doctor that abused them. It said that the children had no place to hide the body, so they cut it up in small pieces, which they hid around the mansion. Rumors exist that the teenagers who had broken into the mansion saw ghosts of the children and claimed to see shadows of the doctor's murder through the light coming from an open door. Legend has spread throughout the region, even becoming the subject of a 2011 film simply titled The Melon Heads, which is based around the West Michigan legend. Oh, we have to watch The Melon Heads. The Melon Heads. Let's see how it's. The IMDb. IMDb. Let's have a look at The Melon Heads on IMDb. Melon Heads. Uh, it got a 6.1, actually. So, oh, it's not too bad. We should watch it. We should. Okay. In just. Uh, I have something that I want you to watch off camera at some point. Off camera? <laughs> off, off microphone at some point. Let me keep going. But yes. Eventually. The melon head stories of Ohio are primarily associated with the Cleveland suburb of Kirtland in Lake County. Da, da, da. Oh no, it's just more shit. Just melon heads. Melon just heads melon doing melon head things. And melon heading. Yeah. Just melon heads. I think... If we need to add it. melon heads to the tier list. I think as an insult it works pretty well as well. You fucking melon you head. Fucking melon head. Stop acting like a melon head. Oi. Tron, stop being a fucking melon head. Stop being a melon head. Where are we putting it? I the melon I'd... heads. It's gotta be near the Green Children of Warpit. I don't know if they're quite as good as the Green Children of Warpit. Below Rufus Rice? I would say so. Between Rufus Rice and Arthur and Benga? Yes, that sounds like a great a great place for melon the melon heads to exist. Heads, cool. Yeah, they need cool. to be added for sure. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I think it's time we take a little bit of a break. You know. Uh yes. We'll come back in that a second. That works for me. We will be back in a little bit. Hello and welcome back to the court of Tom and Tron. To start with. I'm getting my gavel ready. You ready? Sorry. Yes, I was getting my gavel ready. There we go, yeah, but I'm ready, ready to go. Order! Uh, after I've just made Tom witness probably the most weirdest YouTube video we've ever seen in our lives. We've just watched, uh, what was it called? It was called, if you ever see this fat clown at the clown tunnel, don't let him eat you, run away fast. And it's just 20, 20 minutes of just them following this fat clown. It's stupid. Yeah. It was a great time. It was... Anyways... We're gonna we're gonna cut to the chase. Yes, that's the less I've said about that, the better. So here we go. Am I in the wrong for pre-gaming my wife's dinners? <laughs> no, <laughs> off the bat, no. My wife and I are both thirty-two. Since we got married and moved in together five months ago, why, my wife has simply not made nearly enough food for me. This is not a kind of situation where I'm constantly agitated at her for her incompetence or anything like that. I would be more than happy to microwave a burrito. I would be more than happy to whip up a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. 
but I can't. My wife has, every single night of our marriage, done the same thing. She'll make me a tiny dinner. I'm talking like a Chinese chicken salad with 30 grams of chicken and 10 leaves of lettuce arranged fashionably with dressing. When I finish eating, I'm still hungry because for a £230 man who works a physical labour job, it's not enough food. At first, I tried to openly communicate with her, but she always took it horribly. She would adopt a thousand yard stare and then begin talking about how incompetent she is and how she can't even make her husband a proper dinner. I tried to calm her down with, oh honey, that's not the case, I just eat too much, or don't worry about it, I can make a bit more. I tried to be overwhelmingly positive, it never helped. She would always get just incredibly disappointed in herself, cry and or take it out on me. Then she would make the exact same amount the following day. After the communication route failed, I tried to eat her dinners as is. It became hard to sleep at night due to hunger and I lost £7 in the first month. Wow. Eventually, I figured out my own system. On the way home from work, I started swinging by a fast food restaurant and get myself a burger. I would basically pre-game her meals with some more calories. I figured it was win-win, as what she doesn't know can't hurt her. I could have my fill of food. I would eat on my way home, walk in the door, pick at the salad or quinoa or homemade mac and cheese she made, compliment her for her delicious cooking, and later dispose of the wrappers discreetly. Two days ago, I was on my way home and in line at a drive through My mother-in-law was coming out of the restaurant. She ran over and greeted me. I asked her in a humorous way not to tell her daughter where she saw me because she'd take it badly. She agreed, but then she narked on me anyway. I got home to a furious wife who demanded details. When I provided the truth, she got extremely angry and looked legitimately hurt. I'm not good at handling confrontation and feel like I betrayed my wife in some way. Was I wrong here? No. Your wife should just cook more food. <laughs> yes. You've asked her like five times by saying, but can you please cook more food? Numerous times. And then she'll just start crying. I do understand. She's probably trying her best and is probably putting her heart and soul into the cooking. Like, yeah. I don't do that myself. I don't put my heart and soul into the cooking. Me neither. I don't really put a whole bunch into my cooking. As it is. Food. Just just food. Just the bare minimum of food. Yeah. But uh, I, I don't see any wrong with this. It's kind of weird that you was hiding it though. Or we didn't just say, hey, like, these really aren't enough. Like, I lost seven pounds. Like, I need to eat more, please. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, it's, yeah I, I do like the idea of him going out and pre-game me also. It's kind of funny. Fair enough. I, when he first read out the headline, I thought he was going to go and, like, start drinking before the meal and, like, pre-game it that way. <laughs> no. I, took it. I thought he'd just be, like, that five be pints much. deep. You're pre-gaming every family dinner with five pints that's a bit that's a bit that's, that's an alcohol problem right speaking there speaking of pints though I came across this man on my TikTok who's attempting to drink 2,000 pints in a year he's drinking 2,000 yes and on his last TikTok live he put 22 away in a night what was he like how was he the end of it I didn't watch the live I just came back <clears throat> I, his video came across my few page let me find it him Oh, was he just uh, I'm hoping he looked like a mess because if he didn't look like a mess after 22 points then I think he's, wrong with him. he said that he can basically just function pretty well with, on like 5 or 6 because he's just so used to it now um, but um, yeah I can't be good for you at all no uh, where's this one day 47 day 47 of trying to drink 2,000 pints in a year oh, he's yesterday got that voice, we had 9 we're on a total of 354, place an average of five point, uh, 7.53, we need to maintain an average of 5.4, so we're actually over two points, an average over, that's quite good, that's quite good, uh, we need to maintain 166.6 every month, so we're what, we've done this month already, and we're what, 15 days in, nice, 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 it's... He does it's give impressive. off that look. He does. He's, he's doing that for. Yeah. I don't know. I'm kind of worried that you get. He, he looks say like he could be an. I know he gives off the vibe. He could be quite a an angry drunk. Yeah. Day one hundred and twelve of trying to drink two thousand pints in a year. We have a new high score. Uh, we did twenty two pints on live yesterday, and yeah, by the end of it, we were singing Adele. We were doing all sorts. Quite funny, quite fun. We had special guests on. We had all sorts going on. I absolutely loved it. So we are at a total of 1,026. We have an average of 9.1. Average of 9.1 uh, pints a day. Average, well, we've got 974 to go. This is like day 100. Like, it's not... We have 253 days to go. We need an average of 3.84. days. And we've already got 1,000 pints. Uh, I think... I think this challenge might be uh, 
Can we to a conclusion? Because if we start doing 20 a day, this is not going to take very long at all. Like, mate, 18 days or something. Alcohol yeah, poisoning. The comments on under this are my favourite things. Okay, like, Paul Gascoigne wears John May pajamas. <laughs> <laughs> oh, John, I feel it would be more of a challenge to limit yourself to 2,000 pints in a 365 days at this stage. Um, yeah, and someone else said, if I drank 22 pints, I'd be unable to function for the next three days. So, but he's 112 days in, and he's got 954 pints to go. Jesus Christ, this man's putting them away. Oh my God. Christ. That's... Uh... That's scary. Anyway, yes. This man's wife needs to cook him more food. Or let him do the cooking. Let Yeah, maybe he should do the cooking. Maybe you should step in the kitchen. Yeah. Get to work. I sentence him to a year in the kitchen, you know. No, I don't think that's the issue here. But then the wife could make Maybe some they should cook puddings. together. Cook together. There that's we it. go. That's a good one. We've sentenced you to a lifetime of cooking together. Very good. Case dismissed. What's the next one? The next one is, my son walked in on my wife and me having sex. What is the Ooh. best way to handle this topic? Okay, well, this has come in from one of our very avid listeners. Yes. And uh, they're, they're in a bit of a sticky situation now, as you can tell with the headline. So yeah. we are here to help, for sure. My son walked in on me and my wife having sex. We were partaking in the style of the dog with our backs to the door. <clears throat> Suddenly, in a moment of comedic brilliance that he may never fully understand, my son burst into the room exclaiming, what's going on in here? Thinking back, I was shielding my wife from view with only my backside revealed to him, and I could have stayed there. However, in a mam- moment of panic, I did what can only be described as a flying, semi-erec- flying erection semi-cartwheel off the far side of the bed, where I crashed to the floor while my wife covered up. My son left, and we all went to sleep without any conversation. He's still sleeping, but I don't know the best way to handle this. We haven't had the talk with him yet, but I'm not sure I want him to associate sex with my nude acrobatics. What's the best way to handle this issue? Wow, how old's the son? Nine. Ah, the, the talk's coming pretty soon. Yeah. This talk is definitely coming pretty soon. Um, I, I do really want to see what his nude acrobatics look like now. He said he did a... cartwheel off the side of the bed to the a floor. A flying erection semi-cartwheel off the far side of the bed. That sounds, sounds like that should be an Olympic sport. Yes, I'd love to see the Olympic flying erection semi-cartwheel. <laughs> you were just like getting on and that's... You, Somebody walks in the room, you got to get off the bed as quick as you can. Yeah. Sounds like a great sport. Um, yeah, I, I, I think they've got to have a conversation with the son about the birds and the bees. Maybe lock the door next time. Yes, that would be my first thing. Is lock the door. What if their bedroom doesn't have a lock? Then make sure your son's in, asleep in bed. Yeah, and be quiet. And be quiet. Don't make noises. Put a sock in it. <laughs> Put a sock on it. Put a sock make on sure it as well. Make another son. Yeah, yeah, do that. Yeah, you don't want any more sons walking in on you having sex later yeah. on down the road. Um, what do we sentence them to do? You got to you got to give the son the birds and the beast chat. By yes. sounds of it, um, that should be coming pretty up soon at school, anyway. So, yeah, that should be a problem. Lock lock the door, and, then, and maybe maybe they just got to they got to do it in different places and not in the bedroom now. I thought you meant like. But surely the bedroom's the better place for it. It is, but but the son's just going to keep him walking in now, though, isn't he? Mate, I don't think he's got a taste for it, mate. <laughs> Let's <laughs> lock the door. No, you'll just hear the noises again. Just like, what's going on in here again? Well, if they're quiet, that won't happen. Yeah, put, put a sock in it. That's that's my. Yep. Put a sock in it. Put a sock on it. Uh, what's the sentence, Tron? Socks. You're sentenced to socking. Sentenced to socking. Socking. Agreed. Yeah. Okay. Um, I don't think I have much else from the Court of Tom and Tron. This episode is a little bit of a shorter episode. Is it? But that's okay. Okay. We're, we're, we're going to leave you with a couple quotes. A couple from of quotes. Tom Garstang right now. Only one quote from me. Oh, okay. I've got one. Do you want to hit yours first or something? Yes. So, uh, my quote is, is if you see someone levitating, as we've had a lot of levitation in the past few episodes, uh, just walk away. Don't ask questions. Just let it happen. Okay. Just let, let it happen. Just okay. walk away. Okay. I've got cooking one meal doesn't make you a chef. 
Cutting one person's hair doesn't make you a barber. Playing one basketball game does not make you an NBA player. Mm -hmm. So how does kissing my homie goodnight one time make me gay? See you in the next episode. <laughs>